Hello everybody, it's me, Ken Bok, uh, from A Course in Miracles Explained. And on the line, I have the one and only Kenneth Wapnick. Oh my god, you're not starting that way, are you? <laughs> Ken, you promised to be serious. Uh, I did, I did actually. Okay. <laughs> um, so, for many of our listeners, uh, Ken obviously needs no introduction. Uh, he is uh, the president of the Foundation for A Course in Miracles. Uh, he has been involved with A Course in Miracles ever since its inception. And in the eyes of many, including myself, he is probably the world's leading authority on the course. Uh, and today, uh, I actually have no plan. I don't know what to ask Ken, because <laughs> I think Ken has, Ken has, you've obviously you know, written so much and spoken so much. I'm at a loss, really. Well, how about uh, I interview you? I'll ask you the questions. How's that? <laughs> I mean, it's one Ken talking to another Ken. Yeah, it's all the same anyway, so, isn't it? <laughs> people will know the difference. <laughs> you might not fool the serious ACIM students, though. I see. All right. Okay. So uh, I'm supposed to shut up and, until you say something? Is that it? No. No, I ask the questions, and then, and then you, you, you uh, pontificate. Uh, I see. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, okay, but but seriously, um, you know, I like I like this interview to be sort of an introduction to you. Um, okay. And I know you're a very private person, uh, and I know you don't like to talk about yourself. Um, but it might be useful. But you're gonna ask me questions anyway. Yes. Okay. You're gonna pry into my into my personal life. <laughs> You All you right. do not have to answer anything that, you know, you, you don't want to answer, obviously. Okay, uh, I'll be serious. <laughs> um, no, I thought this interview would be good to for people who, who don't know Ken Wapnick, who don't know who Ken Wapnick is, but then have obviously seen all the stuff that you produced. And, you know, there are there are some interviews of you, about you. There's one I'm, I, I just looked at before this uh, with Ian Patrick. And that was a fantastic interview. But... Um, could you summarize your illustrious life in about a couple of minutes? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was born in Brooklyn. Uh, uh, and I ended up in Temecula. <laughs> you want something more than that, right? <laughs> that would be that would be good. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, Please. Uh, I was raised in a Jewish home. Uh, my parents were kind of very Jewish and typical of many many Jewish people that they they were more uh, a culturally identified with Judaism rather than with uh, the religious aspects. Mm. Um, I was sent to a, a yeshiva, which is like a parochial school, for eight years, mm -hmm. first eight grades. And, and my parents sent me there not so much for the Hebrew education, I think just that there was like a private school that was in the area, so that, that I would get a good education. Mm. Uh, I did rather well in English, I did not do well in Hebrew, uh, uh, I did not like it, and uh, I didn't believe any of it. Mm. And uh, uh, we read the, the five books of Moses, uh, the first five, five books of the Old Testament, three times in the course of the eight years, and then... The, the rest of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. So I really learned it very, very well, and I, I was perfectly fluent in Hebrew. Yeah. Um, but I just didn't believe it, and I didn't like it. Uh, it didn't make any sense to me. And, and my parents really didn't really care so much. But again, they were not religious people in the usual sense of the word at all. Mm. Um, and, and when I graduated in at, at, at the eighth grade, I, I went to a, to, a, to a public high school. Uh, and I, I think I probably, in those years, considered my, myself an agnostic. Uh, uh, I, I didn't really believe in God. I didn't really care about God. Uh, I had no use for, for religion. Uh, and actually, what what became extremely important today was music. And mm. uh, uh, two things happened, actually, in my junior year in high school, which I guess I was about 16 years old. Uh, one that my, what was that? my mother joined the classical music club. She thought it would be nice if we, uh, my brother and I, he's four years younger than I am, uh, were exposed to, to classical music. Mm -hmm. And so that, that began a, like a lifelong a love affair with music, and uh, it began with Beethoven especially. Um, and that, that just kind of grew over, over many years. And, uh, but at the same time, 
that 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 happened, I uh, I stumbled on a book about Freud, and uh, I was a, an avid reader, but I was a kid, I was a kid, and uh, I had heard Freud's name, and I was looking for for a book to read in the library, and and, and this book almost really fell fell off the shelf into my hand. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was written by Calvin Hall, and it's called, called the Freudian Primer. Mm-hmm. It was basically a kind of a, a simplified overview of uh, uh, psychoanalysis. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I read it, and I loved it, and uh, I've always preferred reading primary sources than secondary sources. So uh, I think soon after that, I started reading Freud himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, I read The Interpretation in Freud, which was probably his most important book. And uh, I was still in high school, so God knows what, what I understood. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but uh, I decided right then and there that, that I'd become a clinical psychologist and I'd, I'd get my Ph.D. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was not interested in becoming a psychiatrist because I had no interest in medicine or uh, uh, you know, studying chemistry or biology. Mm-hmm. So I just decided right then and there that that's what I would do, and I never really wavered from that. So at, 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 at this time in my life, these two strands were going on. One was kind of more external. Uh, I read as much for it as I could. I read other uh, psychologists, and uh, I was very much interested in that. But at the same time I was doing that, I was developing my interest in, in music. Uh, a Beethoven first, and then, then Mozart. I discovered opera when I was a freshman in high school, in college. And, and uh, so there were like two tracks in my life. One I knew was internal, and one was external. And I couldn't see a way of integrating them, but but at that point I didn't have to. So uh, in college I took more literature, art, and music classes than I did psychology classes, even though I majored in psychology. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I kind of went through that that whole period like that. Uh, the, the real love of my life was music. Mm-hmm. Uh, I went to a college that was a, a, a couple of hours away from from New York City, uh, and. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I cut classes sometimes. I go to, to opera. I go to Carnegie Hall, mm. uh, and music really was the most important part of my life. Why? Uh, um, what What it, about music? I mean, it sounds like I a silly think, question, but why, yeah, what no, about no, music? actually, it's not not silly. Uh, it, it 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 awakened something in me that at that point I had no words for. Mm. Uh, but it it really kind of awakened, I guess, what I would say would be like, like my spiritual self. Which again, at that point, I would not have used words like that. Yeah. But it was something that I knew was more important and was more true than anything I was studying in psychology. Uh, I did very, very well in psychology, and uh, and I understood that all everything I was I was reading and studying. But I knew it didn't mean anything, and I knew that that music did because it it, it pointed to something I knew was significant. In people, mm. and I believe that that since I was having these kinds of inner experiences listening to this to this wonderful music, that that experience had to be present in everyone because mm. it couldn't just just be in me. Uh, and that so that what it did was, in a sense, it kept me spiritually honest during during my early years when when I, I had no external interest uh, in anything religious mm. or spiritual. Uh, I loved great <laughs> great literature too, and that that also. Kind of, kind of fed that same. I think I needed myself, but at the same time, this was happening again. I was, I was preparing for a normal life uh, to to be a psychologist and get married, which I did. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> uh, but I knew nothing I was doing externally could really touch this, uh, and so I, its importance for me was simply that it, it really kind of opened up the, this other world, this inner world, mm-hmm. uh, and. It was clearly the most important part of, of my life. Mm. Even in graduate school, I went to a, to, a, to a school on Long Island outside, outside New York City. I'd cut classes then, too, but there'd be a great great opera singer or a great conductor. Mm. Uh, and I'd go, and, uh, go into Manhattan mm. uh, to, to attend the, the performance. And that was more important to me. Mm. So that that really happened. Those uh, began in high school with, with all through college and all, all through graduate school. Mm-hmm. So, so, so how's that for, for openness? It's great. It's it's great. Do you wanna? Mm, and then you met you met. Um, well, this is obviously fast forwarding very rapidly. And you you met yeah. Bill and Helen in 1972. Uh, and was and, yes. Well, that, yeah, well, we skipped a lot, right? By that time, I had already uh, my wife and I had got got a divorce. Mm. Uh, I was preparing to become a monk. Mm. Uh, I had had my 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 degree. I had been working as a psychologist. 
Um, and I decided that I was going to leave all that and enter a monastery. Mm. Um, um, and it was shortly after that that uh, I met Helen and Bill mm. the first time. Uh, they were they were very friendly with the, with the Catholic priest. Uh, his name was uh, Benedict. Uh, and actually, uh, I was going to become a Trappist monk. That was the the, the order that I was interested in. Uh, and this is actually an important part of the story. I um, uh, I began I began reading Thomas Merton, mm. uh, who was a, a famous Trappist monk. Uh, in the Roman Catholic Church, and he was a uh, he wrote very very well, and I liked his writings a lot. And mm-hmm. he described what life was like in the monastery, and I realized that that's that's really what I wanted to to, to do: just live a life totally alone with God. Mm-hmm. Uh, the fact that this was Christian made made no, no difference to me. I had no conscious experience with Jesus or a relationship with Him. Uh, there was nothing about the Catholic Church that, that I respected. Mm-hmm. Um, but in order to become a Trappist monk, I had to become a Catholic. So mm-hmm. I was working in a, in a hospital upstate New York, and so, so I spoke to the chaplain there <clears throat> and, uh, and told him what, what I wanted to do. And he said, well, here's a book uh, on, on Catholic teaching. Read it, and if you have any questions, I'll answer them, and then, and then I'll baptize you. He didn't quite know what to do with me, hmm. actually. He was a kind of a simple man, and I had a Ph.D. I was a, a big shot in the hospital. Uh, I just c- come back for, from a week at the Abbey of Gethsemane in Kentucky, which was uh, uh, Thomas Merton's monastery. So what were your feelings um, towards Jesus at this point? I Well, I, I had a funny relationship with Jesus all, all my life. <clears throat> I had no conscious feelings about him, but even as a child, I would sometimes uh, uh, sneak a Bible into bed at mm-hmm. night, and read the New Testament. Mm-hmm. Uh, my father had uh, had taken a Gideon's Bible from a motel one time, so that there was an older New Testament in the house. Uh, and so, so I started reading, and I was really interested in it. And then uh, I knew that I had to hide it, <laughs> because my parents wouldn't like it. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> uh, I once went to a church uh, on a Sunday morning when I was in high school, uh, and I just wanted to go, and I just went. And, uh, of course, I loved all the great uh, music of Bach and uh, Handel and Beethoven and Mozart, mm. the church music. Uh, but, it, but it had nothing to do, I thought, with the, with the, with the text. It had to do just, just do with the great music. Mm. Um, but, but Jesus would surface every once in a while. Uh, and I'd read a book about him. Um, and then, but I was married, this is where, in, in the 60s, the mid-60s, and I was still in graduate school. Mm-hmm. Uh, my, wife, my then wife and I went to a, kind of an art exhibit in Greenwich Village, and there was a painter that we really liked. Mm-hmm. And we liked him so much, we asked him if he had any other paintings, and he, he invited us to his, to his studio. And, and we went there one evening, and I walked in, and there was this big, big picture of Jesus. It, it was four feet by six feet. Hmm. Uh, it was painted on wood. It was a, a hideous picture, actually. It was obviously a very suffering Jesus. Hmm. Uh, he, he was not on a cross, it was just his head. Uh, but it was very, very powerful. And, and I bought it. And, and I hung it. <laughs> we, lived in, we lived in a small apartment. Uh, and it took up a good part, part of the wall space of the apartment. Uh, <laughs> and it, it was a very important painting for me. Uh, and I never thought about I knew that it was of Jesus. Uh, but I never thought about it, other than uh, I wanted it. And I could always, I would feel a real presence from that painting. Mm. Um, and when, uh, when Ruth and I broke up, I moved upstate to, to a place in Poughkeepsie, and I, one of the first things I did was find a place for this painting. Mm. Um, and uh, it was very important to me. And so I you, ended you up liked it even though... The, <laughs> sorry, you liked it even I'm though sorry, you were suffering a lot. Well, I didn't. It was something. It, had, it was Jesus. That's all I could tell you. It, it was a. Uh, it was a painting that was it was very very powerful, mm. uh, <clears throat> and uh, you it obviously was a very kind of suffering type face. Mm. Uh, and I didn't relate to it. I, I didn't relate to the suffering so much. It was more that it, it was of Jesus. Mm. And I ended up building an altar to it without realizing. I thought I was just putting a little table underneath it. I ended up building an altar. Mm. Uh, but uh, so that was a very important thing that I owned. Uh, actually, mm. not a lot to me, um, but I never thought about it in terms of Jesus. And when I when I started reading Merton, and he he, he talked about Jesus and, and the monks and everything, all I could all all I could think of was God. Mm. Now my doctoral dissertation was on mysticism, and I did it on a Christian mystic, Saint Teresa of Avila. Um, 
and I did it. Uh, I liked her very, very much, and I used her as an example because I couldn't. I couldn't write a thesis on Beethoven, which is what I wanted to do. I knew I'd never get that approved, mm-hmm. um, and so I, I took Teresa's experiences uh, as a metaphor. When she talked about Jesus and talked about God, as a metaphor for this inner experience that that was more uh, abstract uh, that I could relate to from my own listening to music. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the fact of the matter was that after two years, I spent a very intimate time with this with this with this Catholic saint, you know, uh, and I never thought again. I never thought once about the fact that she was Christian, that this had to do with Jesus, even though she wrote a great deal about Jesus. Mm. So I, I always had this kind of funny thing with Jesus going yeah. throughout out my life, mm. uh, and this was up to and, and including the time that I met Helen and Bill, mm. uh, and even though I was planning on becoming a monk. I, the fact that it had to do with Jesus didn't mean anything to me. Mm-hmm. All that mattered to me was I could be alone with God. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I had a number of other kinds of experiences that we don't really have, have time for now, but it was, they, they, a lot of them had to do with Jesus. Yeah. Uh, and, and I didn't, uh, I'm, uh, I spent a lot of time with my dreams and a lot of time thinking about what was happening inside of me, but, but I never put two and two together uh, in terms of Jesus, not at that point. Mm, interesting. Uh, so, so you had so, so you that had, leads up to, to when I met Helen and Bill. Hmm. And so, so you alluded to some some of your dreams. You, you, looking back, would you say it was Jesus in your dreams? Uh, some of the dreams had to do with that. Uh, other dreams had to do with God, uh, or what, what my experience, experience was of God. Hmm. Uh, I, I had an experience. Uh, one dream was of uh, Thomas Merton. Uh, talking to me, and he was talking to me in his dream about Jesus, and I could feel a tremendous sense of kind of a, a, a like a force going through through my body. This isn't a dream, mm-hmm. and saying uh, he's coming, he's coming. Wow! Uh, and I knew when I awoke that that was a very important dream uh, that I, I knew it had to do with Jesus. But again, I didn't do much with it. I just kind of set, set all that aside. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, as something that was interesting. I remember the dream, I wrote it down. But I never allowed myself at that point to, to really identify with Jesus. Hmm. Um, and how did you, um, did you ever talk to your parents about this? Uh, not at that point, no. Uh, I, I didn't talk with anybody really about what was happening inside of me for hmm. a long, long time. Uh, it was, it was, uh, I, it was very private. Uh, I wouldn't even know, have known how to talk about it. But when I was in graduate school, we were a small class. We were like 12 people, and then ended up we were 10 people for, for three years. So we knew each other very well. And uh, a couple, a couple of my, my friends would ask me, like, why, why did I go to? Uh, what was it about about music? That, and why was I reading these kind of kind of literary books? Uh, these these, uh, these kind of novels that were kind of had a spiritual sense to them. Such why would, as? Um, I read a lot of Thomas Mann, a great German novelist, and mm. uh, Dr. Faust is probably his greatest book, mm. uh, and uh, which is a retelling of the, of the Faust legend, but uh, uh, with a composer. Mm. But it is a profound spiritual message in, those book, in his book. Uh, he wrote a book, Joseph and His Brothers, which is kind of loosely based on the biblical jo- uh, Joseph, mm-hmm. uh, The Magic Mountain. Uh, I also read about Herman Hesse, who's also a great. Oh, I love German Herman Hesse. Yes. Yeah, and so he has a lot of obviously you know that a lot, a lot, and he, he yeah. does basically the same theme in every book. Yeah, the glass you know, beat game. Uh, the, the conflict between spirit and, and, and the flesh. So. Mm. Um, so, so people would ask me uh, what all this was about. I, I, some, some professors would ask me, and I, it never. It was very hard for me to, to talk about it. And when I try to. Uh, it, it it just didn't kind of kind of resonate with people, so uh, I I basically kept it to myself at this point. Uh, later on, uh, I did have to talk with my parents about what was happening, mm-hmm. uh, not so much inside, but what the external things that were happening. Yeah. they were very very upset uh, with what they thought was happening to their son, the nice Jewish boy. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, it ended up actually that, that my parents got to know Helen and Bill, especially Helen very very well. Helen and my mother became good friends actually. Mm. Because so, they were of so the same generation, right? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Hmm. Uh, and 
Helen and Bill made a very good impression, obviously. Yeah. And they were both respectable people, intelligent. So yeah. uh, it, 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 was a, it was a nice bridge. It made it easier for my parents. Then. So, but, but they could never really adjust to, to, to anything Christian, even though I explained to them that, that the courses of Christianity had, had nothing to do with, uh, with Christianity. Mm. Uh, and that the Jesus at the course, uh, the Jesus, of course, has nothing to do with the Bible. Yeah. Uh, but it, it was still very, very hard for them. Mm. But, could you tell us a little bit about Helen and Bill and just kind of how you describe them? Uh, they were very unusual people. Um, uh, I don't think I ever knew two people who disliked being in the world as much as they did. Uh, <laughs> certainly in the years that I, that I knew them. Uh, Bill kind of changed a little bit many years afterwards. But, but during the time he was in, in New York, he, he really had, both of them had a lot of trouble living. They just didn't didn't like it. Uh, uh, they both had very profound spiritual sides. I, I, I think Helen was was probably the most unusual person I've ever met. Hmm. Um, um, uh, but they didn't they didn't look like it, and they didn't act like it. Uh, um, and I think the most striking thing, which I've kind of, kind of mentioned other times, the, the thing that that hit me almost from the beginning. Was how how much they they disliked each other and projected onto each other. Mm. At the same time, there was a, a very close a bond between them. Yeah. Uh, but they could not sit in the same room and talk without arguing, mm. except when it came to the course. When it came to the course, all that was set aside, and they and they did. Uh, uh, they were really there was no ego involved when they were dealing with the course itself. Yeah. But every other thing they they were involved with was awful, just awful. I mean, they, uh, they, they projected like crazy onto each other. Uh, Helen at least knew she was projecting. Bill often didn't, uh-huh. uh, which made it even uh, even more uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, but they were but they were wonderful people, and they both had they both had a, a very uh, a very strong spiritual side to them. Uh, so. You know, um, Carol House. Uh, biography of 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 Bill yes. talks uh, talks about Bill's past lives as as origin. Uh, well, that that was uh, uh, Helen. Uh, Helen once saw looked at Bill and saw this word written over him, him origin over his head. Mm. At that point, neither of them knew what the word was or who origin was. Mm. Uh, but Helen could often be 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 wrong, and uh, you know I, I, I think to. Uh, to uh, I think it's a mistake to make too much of that. Yeah. But, uh, I know Carol mentioned it in her book. Yeah. Uh, and it came from Helen seeing origin over Bill. Gotcha. Uh, uh, and, you know, but it's true, and I have no, no idea. Uh, Helen yeah. did a funny thing. Helen once, Helen once looked at me and said, Habakkuk. Now, uh, the Habakkuk is one of the minor Jewish prophets. Uh, there's a book of Habakkuk in the Old Testament. Now, Helen did that, said that. Hmm. You know, I, I don't know where. Now, uh, I'm not even sure that there was a Habakkuk, even though there's a book by his name. Yeah. You know, uh, so, I mean, uh, Helen could, could be very wrong about specific things. Yeah. So, uh, and Do I think you, that there's a danger in, in, in not recognizing that. Have you ever had memories of your past lives? Uh, no, I'm not into that stuff. I, I, I never, uh, I'm not saying it's not true. Uh, I do believe that there are past lives. Mm. But it, it never seemed like an area that, that I should get, get involved with. Yeah. Uh, I, I, it, I, it certainly seemed, when I first met Helen, and she, she met me, it was like an instant kind of rapport, and I'm sure that, that I was with Helen before, just like with Gloria, my wife. Uh, you know, there was, there's a connection that goes very, very deep. Mm. So uh, I, I, I wouldn't doubt that there have been a past, past rise, but I don't, I, I don't go into that, and I, it, it's never been an interest of mine, so... Gotcha. And, and I never asked Helen. So. Mm. so, could you tell us about the and now? Now we're moving into the the, the describing of the course uh, proper. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell us a bit about that. That those uh, those few years, seven years, was it? Uh, so describing, of course, Helen and Bill describing of the mm-hmm. course. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, it was. Uh, I was not there then. So they, they, oh, they, sorry, Helen yes. finished, uh, but, not, but, uh, but I know a lot about it. Helen finished taking the course down in September of uh, 1972, and I met them at the end of November of that same, same year. So the course was just finished at that point. Gotcha. Um, 
I think that w- that would be an example of what I mentioned earlier, Ken. That they um, they fought like crazy about everything, yeah. but when it came to the course, they worked very very beautifully together, for, like a duet. And uh, so the uh, um, uh, the the process of Helen taking it down uh, was not difficult, actually. I think mm-hmm. uh, after she got over the the initial anxiety about about what was happening, uh, the, the 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 detail the the actual mechanics of it uh, were very simple. Mm-hmm. Uh, now Helen told me, by the way, that she didn't really hear an inner voice. Uh, she used that term because that's what people do. What she really what happened was she would see words in her head uh, mm-hmm. and write them down. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it wasn't that she literally heard a voice. Uh, it was more that she kind of saw words and wrote them down. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, uh, I, I I don't know what what else I should say about it. they. I mean, they, I mean the the actual uh, how it happened. Uh, Ken, um, what, what would you like me to talk about? Um, uh, I mean, I, I, exactly how how they went about doing it. Is that what you mean, or I guess? Um, actually, the no, one thing that I wanted to to, to kind of bring out is um, Helen's scribing. You know, I asked you a question about the special messages, and and you said to me that Helen's uh, uh, the first part of the course was tainted with her ego, and as it got along, it got clearer. Could you tell us a yes, bit more about that? Okay, uh, that's pro- that's probably I would say probably the first four or four, four and a half chapters of the text is what, is what we're speaking about. Um, uh, you know, people feel or say that that everything Helen quote heard un- unquote uh, has to be f- from Jesus, and that's just you know, that's just uh, it's silly actually. And Helen never believed that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the early the early scribing, which we're talking about, probably I would say the first month or so, um, uh, was more Helen's experience was more like she and Jesus were sitting on the couch having a conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was, and and she wrote down everything that she that she quote heard. Uh, uh, a lot of that was uh, kind of questions and answers. Uh, uh, Helen would hear Jesus say something, and uh, she, she would write it down, and then have a question about it. Uh, there was a lot of material that was geared towards uh, helping Helen with her relationship with, with her husband Louis, uh, with Bill certainly helping build other relationships in his life. Um, uh, it was a lot about psychology, and all of this was really. Uh, in fact, Jesus told Helen Bill that all this material would be taken out. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and I think, in part, it was because nobody didn't really belong in the in the actual teaching of the course. And number two, a, a lot of it is just is just mistaken. Uh, one one very clear example uh, would be that some of the some of the things that Helen took down had to do with sex and homosexuality. Bill was homosexual, mm. uh, which was a problem for Helen. And so what she wrote down was uh, purporting to come from Jesus was the standard psychological view, very uh, uh, no that that homosexuality was a pathology, or that it, it, it was aberrant sexual behavior. Hmm. Uh, and so th- that's what this says. Now, uh, you can't possibly believe Jesus would believe that or say that. Uh, and this would clearly Helen's, Helen's ego. You know, you're right. It's like another way of getting even with Bill. Hmm. You know, because Helen had the heart for... he, he, Even Jesus says that you're uh, you're abnormal. You know, uh, not very nice. <laughs> uh, so, I, so, so that's there. You know, uh, there there are things about Jung. No, I'm not a Jungian. Uh, but I do have a great respect for him. Helen did not know Jung very well and did not like him, and neither did Bill. Uh, the standard psycho- psychoanalytic or Freudian view is that, is that Jung was psychotic wow. and, and, and basically dismissing his work. Well, so there are, are some things in, in, the, in these original dictations where, which are saying things about Jung that are not quite nice, and not to say that he's psychotic, but it, it, it really showed that, that Jesus didn't really understand Jung. Well, I don't think it's had anything to do with Jesus. I think this was Helen. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there are, there are lots of little examples like that, uh, which, and, and it's a shame now that, that, uh, that people have, have access to this, and, and they don't understand it, and they don't, and they think everything again that, that Helen wrote down came from, from Jesus, and that's just not, not the case. Mm-hmm. Now, this all changed uh, after about a month or so, which again, I think, uh, probably uh, the fourth or fifth chapters of the text. Mm-hmm. 
when when the kind of the personal stuff stopped, uh, uh, and and how his experience then was like Jesus was like standing at a lecture and giving a lecture, mm. you know, just as a college professor would, and she she, she was writing down everything that he said. Uh, and, and so from that point on, the material was pretty pretty much the way that it came. Uh, so uh, uh, so again, uh, 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 Jesus had instructed both both Helen and Bill to to take out all that material, uh, and it, it just doesn't belong. Yeah. So uh, Ken, we're talking about you know I guess for people who are listening now, we're talking about Jesus as if it's a fact that he wrote the course. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, first of all, how do you know it's Jesus? Uh, how do I know Jesus? How do you know that? Don't you ask me? How do you know that? How do you know that? How would you know that that the voice Helen heard was Jesus? Correct. Is that the question? Yeah, that's the question. Uh, well, I mean, that's what Helen said, and that's what the voice said. I mean, that's you know, I mean, that, on the level of form, uh, the first person clearly is identified with Jesus. Now he doesn't say, "I'm Jesus." Uh, but you know, example I always use: if you call up your mother, you know, you don't say, "Hi, this is Ken." <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know. I mean, your mother knows you, so so how would knew Jesus? So it wasn't. Uh, yeah, but but there are references. There are very few references to his life, but there are some references to his life. Uh, but clearly, he, he uh, he's uh, the first person in Helen's experience was was Jesus. So, mm. uh, but that was Helen's experience. You know, and I I've, I've taught this a, a lot over the years because people really get uh, confused and they get they get confused with form and content. Mm-hmm. Um, and that uh, you know, the, one of the things that I say, if actually I could tell you a cute story. Uh, once we were we were traveling together, uh, and we we're at the airport, ready to head home, and, and a woman walked up to Helen uh, and said to Helen, knew Helen, uh, knew who Helen was, and said, mm-hmm. "How could Jesus have dictated the course he didn't know English?" Uh, it was kind of a sweet question. Helen was very sweet in her, in her response. I forget exactly what she said, but uh, I know she, she was very sweet to the woman. Well, the fact of the matter is Jesus doesn't know English, and he, and he didn't dictate the course in that way. Mm. Uh, the form of the course is all Helen. Uh, it's English-speaking, it uses American idioms, it's, it's psychological, it's very logical, uh, it's very platonic. Helen loved Plato. Um, uh, Helen loved Shakespeare, so that a lot of the course is in, in blank verse. Helen was a teacher, uh, so uh, it, it's a curricular in its form, has mm-hmm. a text, a workbook, a manual, talks about teaching and, and learning all the way through. Uh, Helen was a Freudian, and as I've been saying for, for over 30 years, without Freud, you would not have had a course in miracles, mm-hmm. uh, because the, the whole psychology of the ego is very psychoanalytic, uh, and on and on and on. So the form of it is Helen, uh, not the content. But the form is, and so what Helen did was able to do, uh, and I was with her many times uh, after the course was, was completed when she did this. Is she would go to that place of abstract, non-specific love in her mind, that's in everyone's mind, mm-hmm. that she identified with Jesus, mm-hmm. and that love that she experienced there then came through her, right. uh, and it came through Helen's brain, which again had all those qualities that I just mentioned, yeah. uh, and out came a course of miracles. Uh, I, it, it's it's not Helen did not treat the words as sacred, you right. know, uh, and uh, uh, and be, because it, she the part a part of her knew that that, that this was not literally Jesus, uh, as I mentioned other times uh, in other places there are a few times there are very few maybe four or five uh, when I was with her when she would go to like another state. Uh, her mind would like be uh, devoid. Her, her brain, her face would be devoid of all uh, emotion, uh, anything, and and she would talk. And it was Helen's voice, but it was not Helen. And, and when she kind of came down from that and came back, she she would say to me, "This this transcended Jesus. This had nothing to do with words. It had nothing to do with anything specific." Uh, well, that's the side of Helen I call called the priestess side in my book, and that's the that's where the course came from. Mm. That kind of that that abstract, non-specific love, that is as close to heaven as low as you can get within the dream. But the form it took was what we call the course. And since Helen identified that that love with Jesus, with whom she had a, had a very deep relationship, love hate, mm. uh, Jesus then became appeared to be the specific source of it. 
But but once you get into this is like the biblical or historical Jesus and every word that Helen heard was true, you're right back into spiritual specialness, and you're right back into what you know has played Christianity for, for 2,100 years. Mm. That kind of specialness with Jesus, and, um, and it, it becomes an exclusive thing. Yeah. And, it, and it, it misses the whole point. It, 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 it changes. You get away from the content, which is the mind, the love in one's right mind, to the form. And then the form becomes sacred, you know. And the words become sacred, and the books become sacred. Well, isn't Jesus um, isn't Jesus a, a specific type of form of the Holy Spirit as well? Yeah, well, yeah. Of course, says that he's a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. You know, but the Holy Spirit too is an illusion. You know, the course says at the end in the clarification of terms, because uh, it's a form. You know, God is God is perfect oneness. There's no differentiation yeah. in heaven. You know, the course says God is first in the Holy Trinity, but there's no second or third. Uh, so, so we're talking about a, a, a heaven being or knowledge, state of knowledge being a state of perfect, undifferentiated oneness. Well, there's no specificity there, so so there can't be a Jesus there. So when you talk about Jesus, you talk about a symbol. Yeah, you know, she teaches that. You also says, uh, and he's a symbol for love that's not of this world. Mm-hmm. See, the problem with all this is that it gets so much into specialness, and it makes Helen special, it makes the people around her special, it makes Jesus special, it makes the course special. Uh, and, and then you end up with different factions at different churches, you know, just like you had with Christianity. You know, it's no different. Yeah. Uh, and I think a lot of it stems from this idea that it's it's confusing form and content, mm. uh, which is the hallmark of specialness. You know, that kind of confusion. Mm. Let, so. Let's let's get back to the story. Uh, okay. Tell us a bit about the where you came in and the the editing of of the course. Um. Okay. Uh, when Helen and Bill gave me the course, what they gave me was what we called the Hugh Lynn version. Uh, Hugh Lynn Casey was Edgar Casey's son, and mm-hmm. Helen and, and Bill had gone gr- down to, to the ARE in Virginia Beach to meet with him. Mm-hmm. And so they prepared this, uh, what then was, was like the, uh, it was not the, not the final, but, but at that point it was the final manuscript for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's why we, we called it that. So that's what I read. And uh, and when I read it, uh, and I got to know Helen and Bill rather well, rather quickly, and I, I read through it, um, and I read it, and I and I said to Helen and Bill, you know, the things here, some things are not quite right. I said, you know, the capitalization is inconsistent, the punctuation is inconsistent, the paragraphing is inconsistent, some of the section and chapter titles are inconsistent. No, all of these were what Helen and Bill did. You know, uh, I said, you know, some of the titles are wrong, and there's some material here that doesn't belong. Uh, just, you know, there's, there's some stuff on Casey, there's a little stuff on Freud that they had not taken out. All the other stuff had been taken out. And I said, I, I, you know, it, it doesn't seem that way, so they agreed with me. Hmm. Uh, I, you know, one of the, one of the, uh, uh, the myths uh, that uh, I know go, goes around is that I'm the one who, who did the editing. Uh, and, I mean, nothing could be further from the truth. Anybody who knew Helen knew th- that nobody could get Helen to, to do anything that she didn't want to do, including Jesus. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, anyway, so uh, I said that to Helen and Bill. We talked about it, and they agreed that the whole thing had to be gone over. Uh, Bill does not have patience for that. He's not an editor. Uh, Helen is the editor. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and Bill, so, so Bill said, uh, you know, agreed that, that I should do that with Helen. Mm-hmm. So it took over a year, uh, but we went through every single word, wow. and uh, and uh, there were times I made suggestions, but but obviously if Helen agreed, it went in. If he didn't agree, it didn't go in. Mm-hmm. Most of the work had to do with those first four chapters, especially I think the first two or three chapters, mm-hmm. because oh, so much of the personal material was taken out that uh, uh, there were there were gaps, and, and and the version I read, some of these gaps were awkward. So, so we had to fix it so that it would read well. Uh, I remember saying to Helen, because we spent a lot of time on this, I remember saying to Helen, why don't you just ask Jesus to, to dictate these four chapters again? You know, and she said, no way. <laughs> you know, once was enough. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, uh, one of the things is that in the version I saw, there were 53 miracle principles. Mm-hmm. And Bill thought that there should be 50. He just thought 50 was a nice number. We should have a round number. So that's what it became. Now, th- those three principles, the, the words we kept, we just incorporated them uh, in the sections uh, in chapter one. 
So I, I mention all this as a way to help you realize that, that we did not think this was sacrosanct, mm -hmm. that these words were sacred. Bill didn't feel that way. Helen Sherwood didn't feel that way. Yeah. I didn't feel that way yeah. because we knew better. Mm. So, so that's what was done. Uh, I think the greatest challenge was the capitalization. Uh, Helen had, had uh, uh, at the beginning, Helen capitalized every word that even remotely had to do with God. Mm. Uh, she also capitalized the word separation to make it stand, stand out like, a, like a, an ontological event. And uh, so all that had to be changed. And I remember saying to Helen, I said, I want to I'll help you develop a, a capitalization philosophy. I will write it down, and then let's stick to it, you know, which she agreed with. And actually, then, in the introduction to, to, the, to the concordance, I put those capitalization rules. Uh, and then... But Helen would change. She had two comma philosophies. One was to have a, a comma practically all the, all the way through everything. The other was to have minimal commas. And she would change that. So when she would change her philosophy, I'd have to go back and change, change all the commas. <laughs> uh, and you know, it was that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, we laughed a lot when we did it. Uh, Helen would, would fall asleep while we edited. Uh, and Helen never fell asleep, <laughs> you know, except at night. So... Uh, so, so we laughed a lot about her, her defenses of her resistance, and uh, mm. uh, but but we went through through every word, mm. and and it ended up to be that was how Helen was very clear that that's how Jesus wanted it. Yeah, and so, so that's what we did. And uh, again, to fast forward, when did you start teaching the course formally? When did I start teaching? Yeah, as in the you know like with the, I guess formally is what I'm saying. In the formally. I, I, I think the first time we actually was an accident. Uh, uh, Gore and I were visiting a Judy Scotch in California, mm -hmm. and she and uh, uh, Bob Scotch and uh, Witt and uh, not, not, the other were were going to Seattle, uh, outside of Seattle. There was there was a Course in Miracles conference at Crystal Mountain, mm -hmm. and so they were speaking, and they asked us to come along. So uh, we came along. And I was not on the speaking schedule. And uh, uh, the first evening, Judy and Witt were, were telling Helen and Bill stories and the sort of how the course was written. And then Judy said that she, she was not the one who should be telling the stories. I should be. So she called, she called me up on stage. And so then we kind of shared, shared stories, et cetera. Uh, and people liked that. And they had a, a, a slot open the next day. So they asked me if I would give a 45-minute uh, talk on the course. Hmm. Uh, which I did, and that was that was actually the first first time I ever publicly spoke, uh, and I don't know it just just started from that. Mm -hmm. uh, I never saw myself as a, uh, a public speaker. I always saw my role as teaching teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember discussing that that a lot with Helen. That that I would there'd be people who who would be teaching the course, and I would teach them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it, it rapidly grew to kind of what, what we're doing now. So, uh, I, yeah, that uh, makes a lot of sense to me because certainly the your material is very heavy, uh, and and it tends to attract people who are very serious about it. Uh, you know, I I don't consider it mainstream, so mm -hmm. that that makes a lot of sense to me. And you know, obviously, um, I guess to be a teacher of the course you have to understand it and you know it's it's through your work mostly that, that a lot of teachers have a really solid understanding of what what the course is saying mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and yeah. yeah i know I'm, sorry so go on no i i um i guess i personally want want to thank you uh you know for for being here <laughs> oh and you know, I think on behalf of a lot of people, Thank you. <laughs> on behalf of a lot of people, I, I just really want to, from the from the bottom of my heart, to thank you, mm -hmm. um, for for doing the work that you do. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> uh, you know, the key thing, which I'm sure you you. You understand very, very well, Ken. Is that uh, the teaching of the course is really not understanding its metaphysics. 
which we go, you know, that's, you take that for granted, or a person in a teaching course, he, he or she ought to know what it says. Yeah. But it's a demonstration of it. Yeah. And that, uh, you know, if you teach it without really understanding it from, from within, then it becomes a, like empty words. And, uh, uh, and that's how I think often then uh, uh, factions start, you know, churches start, uh, my teacher's better than your teacher, you know, that, that, that kind of thinking uh, starts. Mm. But if you really become what the Course says, then, then that's impossible. Uh, and, and it's really, I guess that, that's what I originally thought when I, I had this idea of teaching teachers, you know, many, many years ago, that it, it, it was not only helping people understand what the Course said, but it's also helping them become what the Course said. And that's a much different issue. Uh, but, but that's the crucial one. So why do we need uh, so many words to do that? Uh, you don't need a lot of words at all. Uh, I think I, I think the words come in just, just like the words in the course that it becomes part of a process. Um, you mean the, the the amount of words in the course? Yeah, and yeah. you know, I mean, you've published God knows how many books, and the course is half uh, a million uh, words. You know, so why do we mm, need so mm, many words? I think because we're we're so resistant. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, you know, I've always said that if. If people really understood the first principle of miracles, you wouldn't need anything else. Mm. You know, once you really understand what it means that there's no order of difficulty in miracles, then you understand the uh, the fundamental nothingness of the ego system. You understand what, what the correction of the Holy Spirit is, and that's it. And you don't need anything else. Uh, you know, the Course is very repetitive, uh, and it says the same thing over and over again. But it, it what it, it it does that because it's a process of learning. Uh, and I think what what I've seen see with my with my work, uh, which was not how how I thought, thought of it at the beginning, but looking back on it, is that like if you think of the ladder of prayer that the course talks about that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, my work, you know, the the earlier books are very simple, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, and it's like they begin like at the bottom of the ladder and they gradually move move up. You know, so it, it, I think learning is a process, and even though time is an illusion, uh, since we believe that we are creatures of time uh, and space, that we have to work within the illusion of time, uh, mm -hmm. as the Course does. And so I think that the, the, you know, all those words in the Course and all these books around uh, that are, I've written, that it's, it's like part of the process. Yeah. It's like leading people along. Yeah. You know, at the end you just say, God is, and you cease to speak, and that's it, you know. Mm. So my last book will be called God Is, and then you know I'm finished. So. Wow. Is it, is it, is that, are you serious? No, I don't know. I just said that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to, um, I was wondering if you could say a few words about Love Does Not Condemn, which is, which, I mean, I, I, I told, I talked to you briefly about this, and to, it's such a, <laughs> It's a, it's a, such a scholarly book uh, that mm -hmm. I can't I can't even begin to penetrate it. But do you want to just, just want to talk about it and and what is the main theme in it? Um, a little bit. Well, I can tell, tell a little bit about the, uh, the background of it. Um, uh, when when the course became public, when it became published. Uh, I did I did a lot of work in the Archdiocese of New York because of my friend Father Benedict, and so I had a lot of nuns and priests. Uh, as patients as well, I was giving talks then, uh, not not directly on the course, but on, on spirituality and forgiveness, etc. Uh, but when the course became public, a lot of people within the church began to attack it as being Gnostic. Hmm. Um, and uh, and I I didn't know much about Gnosticism. I, I I'd read a little bit about it, but I didn't really know much about it. But but when people began calling it Gnostic and attacking it on those grounds, I said, well, at least I better, better know what they're talking about. So I began reading some. some some Gnostic literature, and I became, became fascinated by it. Mm. Uh, and so I thought of writing an article uh, on, on the course of Gnosticism and w where the course was Gnostic and where it separated from Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the article grew to a book. Uh, <laughs> and, and so the, the point of the, uh, the book has, I think, a number of different purposes. One of them is to have course students recognize that the course falls within a very definite intellectual tradition uh, in Western thought. Mm. 
you know, people have this idea that, again, that, you know, that uh, here's this w- w- woman who's an agnostic w- or atheist, which is not true, by the way. Helen was ever an atheist. Uh, but the, but this woman who didn't know know anything about anything, all of a sudden Jesus kind of reveals this to her, and, you know, writes his book, and people don't understand that it comes within a very rich intellectual tradition, which is uh, really derived from Plato hmm. uh, and Gnosticism. The highest teachings of Gnosticism are also very Platonic, and so the, one of the purposes of the book again was to place the course in this context, and then to show how it resolves the problem that that has, has played. It. Everyone since the time of Plato, which is how you get from from the perfect one, which is how Plotinus spoke. He was a, a Neoplatonist. How you get from this perfect one? Uh, I didn't talk about God as such, but one for him would be God, and then you end up with this world. You know, how did that happen? And the course is really the best way I, I have seen of kind of not explaining it, but but describing it and giving a context within which we can understand it. And relate to that, and, and and kind of move back from the from the world of multiplicity back to the world of the one. Uh, so it was really a, a way of showing uh, how uh, how the course did this, how it really integrated and and solved this platonic problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was also a way of I think giving Gnostics back their good name, uh, because within most religious circles, certain traditional religious circles, Gnosticism is seen as bad as bad guys. Hmm. Um, and, and that's how, how the Christian churches have always presented them. And to really, in a sense, kind of resurrect them and say, you know, these guys are really brilliant. And, and some of the higher Gnostic teachings <laughs> and teachers uh, really reflect the same kind of metaphysical vision that the Course has. Hmm. So it, it really has had multiple purposes. Hmm. So. How do you see the role of ACIM in the evolution the role of role of what? I'm sorry, Ken. Huh? Sorry. I didn't hear what you said. The role of what? The role of a course of miracles. Oh, oh, oh ACIM. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Yeah, the role of ACIM in, I guess, the evolution of of Christianity on Earth. Um. Well, I'm not a very good prophet, so uh, I'll start <laughs> by saying that. Uh, uh, I, uh, clearly, uh, you know, one of the questions people ask is, you know, if the Course is, is the teaching is so universal, why did it come within a Christian framework? And I think the answer is obvious. Uh, Christianity has not been very Christian. And, uh, and whatever, nobody really knows anything about the, the historical Jesus, even if his name was Jesus. But, but there were, I do believe there, there was a person who appeared, and he did have a message. And whatever that message was has gotten really, really messed up. And so the Course is a way of saying, you know, there's another way of looking at the phenomenon of Jesus, and there's another way of looking at what, what forgiveness is. So, in a sense, it's a way to kind of uh, cleanse the world uh, of a lot of the errors of, of Christianity. Because whether you like it or not, it's a Christian world. Yeah. You know, uh, and, uh, and even in the East, you know, which for so, so long uh, had, had nothing to do with Christianity, now all of a sudden, you know, you find, find Christians all over the place. Uh, and so, basically, the world has become, uh, I think, very, very Christian. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and certainly, the Christian influence, one cannot uh, deny. Mm. So I think, in one sense, of course, there is an attempt to kind of, you, you know, uh, uh, get the record straight. Yeah. Uh, in a larger sense, I do believe that the Course will be extremely helpful uh, in changing the world, yeah. in terms of the world's thinking, not the world as such. Uh, but but it's obvious that that's not for now. Yeah. Uh, I I've always believed that, that that our generation's purpose is to kind of lay a foundation, uh, lower lowercase f, uh, a foundation for, uh, for for how the course will be will be uh, taught later on. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I, I won't be around to see it. Uh, you won't either. I don't think. Ken. Uh, I think I think we're talking about a, a long long term. Mm. Uh, I do think it, it will make a significant contribution at some point, mm. uh, but but at this point, I don't think the world is ready for it at all. So, yeah, uh, but I think when the world is ready for it, the course will be there. Mm. You know, uh, you know, in a way that that was not the case with, with some of the great teachers of the past, including Jesus, that that the teachers have got got so messed up uh, and and distorted. That, that one doesn't know what was said. Uh, but the course, the course is here. Whatever people may want to say about it or, or change it, people have access to the original books.
you know, mm. uh, the way it was originally published. So, um, uh, but uh, what will happen in the future, I don't know. Yeah. You know, I think uh, our job, uh, our function now is just to to preserve it with uh, as much integrity as we can. Mm. So. What are you doing for the end of the world in a week's time? Uh, I'm, uh, I'll probably hit the bars. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I I don't know. I think we'll, we'll be busy. I, I don't know. But what day of the week is that? The 20th, that's the 21st? That's 21st, uh, yeah, 21st. Yeah, week, that's, yeah, one uh, week. that's next Friday. I don't that's know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing this Friday. So uh, I don't know what I'll be doing. Uh, you know, I think that's another thing that, you know, people, people kind of, uh, just try try to do all, all kinds of th things into specific dates, and uh, you know, uh, one one advantage of knowing that that, the, that time is not linear and that the world's an illusion and that everything ha has already happened is that you don't take anything specific seriously. Mm. So, uh, that's my answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, thank you so much for being with us. Any kind of last things you'd like to mention to our, our listeners? Uh, well, I, I think, well, on the one hand, of course, the Merkels is a very ser serious book. Uh, it's not meant to be taken seriously in the sense that it's not meant, to, it's not the book. Uh, it's not the words that are important. It's the love that inspired the words that are, that, that's important. And, uh, you know, one of the things I emphasize so, so often when I teach is the most important thing, I think, if you really want to be a teacher uh, and a student of this course, is to learn how to be kind to everyone and everything. Mm. And if you do that, even if you get the metaphysics wrong, uh, you're doing the course. So when I say not to take the course seriously, I mean don't don't take it seriously as a book, as a movement, as a church, as anything other than 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 uh, something that will help you become more kind. And if you do that, that's that's how the world will end. Mm. Thank you. Okay, uh, pressure, Ken. Good talking <laughs> to you. Likewise. Uh, Okay, was this serious enough, by the way? <laughs> You've been listening to a podcast with me, Kenneth Bopp. My work with A Course in Miracles on YouTube is entirely donation-based. If you'd like to make a donation, you can find the PayPal link in the description page of this YouTube video. For more information about myself or A Course in Miracles Explained, please visit acimexplained.com or kennethbopp.com. Thanks for listening. Bye for now.